songs, several volumes of prose and verse, and he'd acted in over 20 films. Now, 19 years later, Coward seems to be as popular as ever. Two feature films from his plays are in the pipeline. His plays themselves are regularly revived in the West End and on Broadway, and major productions are touring on both sides of the Atlantic. There are two new biographies and a book about his songs, all close to publication. In tonight's South Bank show, Chris Hunt has turned up some rare footage and gathered a posse of friends and assessors to offer a portrait of the man, some called the master. <laughs> Tropical climes at a certain times of day when all the citizens retired to tear their clothes off and perspire. You know, it's one of those rules that the greatest fools obey because the sun is far too sultry and one must avoid the bottom of our little way. Pad like a pad like a pad like a boo, that's natives if you're interested. Digga-digga-digga-digga-digga-digga-digga-doo. The natives grieve when the white men leave their huts because they're obviously, definitely nuts. Mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the middays and the Japanese don't care. The Chinese wouldn't dare to. Hindus and Argentines sleep firmly from 12 to 1, but Englishmen detest a siesta. You know, in the Philippines, they have lovely screens to protect you from the glare. In the Malay states, there are hats like plates, which the Britishers won't wear at 12 noon. The natives swoon and know by the work is done. But mad dogs and Englishmen go out to the middays on... Oh, it's such a surprise for the Eastern eyes to see that though the English are effete, they're quite impervious to heat. When the white man rides, every native hides in glee, because the simple creatures hope he will impale his soul at Topi on the tree. <laughs> have it in the head of in the in hearts, the same natives pay no attention. <laughs> it seems a shame when the English claim the earth. The quintessential English gentleman, Noel Coward, was in fact born just two weeks before 1900 into a lower middle class family in West London. Yes, perfectly ordinary, suburban, middle-class background. My mother's family were all connected with the Navy a great deal. But, of course, we hadn't got very much money, so it was sort of genteel poverty we lived in originally. Dance, dance, dance to the lady, youth is fleeting to the breath of me. Almost from the cradle, Noel's ambitious mother saw star potential in her precocious son. She completely ignored his education. He, he was on the stage from age dot, almost. Um, there was no impetus to do anything that a, a, a normal young boy would do. Noel was a stage-struck little boy who was up there singing, being brought down to, to perform for... for for family evenings, um, and then it was just a natural progression to, to theatre. I was trained when I was very young as a show-off, and I've continued triumphantly until this moment. <laughs> My guiding light in the theatre, or read to the theatre, was the Daily Mirror, because it said, it came out and said that in an attractive, talented and handsome boy wanted. So Mother and I had a brisk conference, and we decided I was talented. Handsome, moot point, but we'd better have a try. And so I went and gave an audition to a lady called Miss Lilla Field. Then I sang a song called Liza Ann from the Orchid, and there was no piano. And so Mother la la the chorus for me to do the dance. You see, I had to do the dance. Mm -hmm. I got the job. Violet Coward's faith in her son was strengthened in 1912 when she went to see a fortune teller at the Colosseum who used items of clothing from people in the audience to divine the fortunes of their owners. She had this sock in her hand and the entire performance came to a grinding halt because her hands began to tremble and she said, Who is the owner of this sock? I must know who the owner of this sock is. And from the stalls came Auntie Violet's word, Yes, right here, a Mrs. Coward. Yes, but who actually wears the sock? Who is the owner of the sock? Mrs. Coward's son, Noel. Well, the woman said, Mrs. Coward, I must tell you that your son, Noel, the owner of this sock, is destined for extraordinary things. I am getting such a vibration from this sock that I cannot but believe that his career is going to be remarkable. From the age of 11 onwards, Noel was acting regularly, but only in minor and supporting roles. Regarding your dear Mrs. Worthington, of Wednesday the 23rd, although your baby may be keen on a stage career, how can I make it clear 
this is not a good idea for her to hope. Dear Mrs. Worthington, is on the face of it absurd. Her personality is not... I had the luck through the agents, Bellew and Stock, to be engaged by Charles Hawtrey to play a page boy. Uh, he was absolutely wonderful to me. He taught me really everything I know about comedy. I still, when I'm faced with a tricky scene to play, I cast my mind back to what the governor would have done with it. He was wonderful. On my knees, Mrs. Worthington. Please, Mrs. Worthington. He continued learning his technique with Hawtrey off and on for the next six years. Don't put your daughter on the stage, Mrs. Then when he was 17, he made a brief appearance in D.W. Griffith's silent film, Hearts of the World. He'd become a professional actor, and his confidence in his ability was already immense. Well, I think I remember meeting him in South Kensington, at the house of some school friend of mine, I was still a schoolboy, and he was there as a guest. And I seem to remember he went and played the piano, and I thought he was rather bumptious and uh, showing off rather. Stardom continued to elude him despite his many efforts, so he turned his hand to writing plays and reviews featuring himself. In 1924, age 24, he wrote his third play, The Vortex. My object in The Vortex was to write a good play with a whacking good part in it for myself. And I'm thankful to say, with a few modest reservations, that I think I succeeded. His character was the son of a woman who made herself look ridiculous by trying to appear young and taking lovers who were half her age. Originally, I had a great friend who had rather a flighty mother, and I was with him at a nightclub. And there she was with a young man and the other people in our party at the nightclub started to laugh at her. And I thought, how awful for him. I, I had once went over and kissed her and said, hello, how are you, dear, etc., etc. And so they shut up, but it was a very bad moment. And I thought, how dreadful of a mother to put her son in such a position. You're neurotic and ridiculous. Just because Bunty broke off your engagement, you think you can come in here and say wicked, cruel things to me? You forget what I've seen tonight, I mother. don't care what you've seen tonight. I've seen you make a vulgar, disgusting scene in your own house, and on top of that, humiliate yourself before a boy half your age. <laughs> the misery of losing Bunty faded away when that happened. Everything is comparative, after all. I did not humiliate you myself. You ran up the stairs after him because your vanity wouldn't let you lose him. It isn't that you love him. That would be easier. You never love anyone. You only love them loving you. <laughs> It can't be such a crime being loved. It can't be such a crime being happy. You're not happy. You're never happy. You're fighting, fighting all the time to keep your youth and your looks. Because you can't bear the thought of living without them, as though it mattered in the end. What does anything matter ever? That's what I'm trying to find out. I'm still young inside. I'm still beautiful. Why shouldn't I lead the life that I choose? You're not young or beautiful. It was an immediate success. It established me both as a playwright as an actor, which was very fortunate, because up until that time, I had not proved myself to be so hot in either capacity. Oh, tremendous. Everybody thought it was very, it was about drugs, which was not talked about in those days, and the sort of mother-son last act, like Hamlet, which was very powerful. <laughs> I can't bear anymore. Uh, I have a slight confession to make. A confession? Yes. Go away, go away! Look! What do you mean? What is it? Don't you know? Vicky, it isn't. You have Why do you look so shocked? Oh, my God. What does it matter? <laughs> that doesn't make it any better. The audience had never seen anything like it. It dealt with taboo themes, was emotionally powerful, and it attacked the shallowness of upper-middle-class society, the very people who flocked to see it. Coward played in it for the first ten months of its run before taking it to Broadway. <laughs> 